Okay. Hello and welcome everyone. Apologies for the slight delay. We were resolving some technical issues, but they all seem to have been worked out. So again, welcome everyone. And thank you for logging into today's session. I'm happy to see this audience. My name is Lorna Quant. I'm a faculty member at Gallaudet University. And I'm one of the co-founders of the Crest Network. I work alongside my colleague, Melissa Malzkuhn. And our goal for this network is to increase the amount of collaboration and communication in the field of everyone working in the convergence of sign language and technology. This is our third event of the Crest Fest 2021. And I'd now like to introduce you to our two hosts for today. We have with us Dr. Raja Kushalnagar, who is a professor at Gallaudet University. He, he will be engaged in conversation today with Dr. Husefa Rangwala. Dr. Rangwala is a professor at George Mason University. And the two of them will talk about topics related to Dr. Kushal Nagar's presentation entitled Inclusive Visual Communication, Learning and Perception for Deaf People Through Artificial Intelligence. The goal of today's event is not to have a scripted formal conversation, but instead to allow for a conversation in which Dr. Kushal Nagar and Rangwala can have a genuine conversation about this topic. Of course, that said, we do have some questions already prepared to spark the conversation, but we absolutely welcome questions from the audience as well. Please do make use of the Q&A feature in Zoom to type in any questions. Using that feature makes it easier for both discussants today to see your questions. That said, I'm looking forward to today's conversation. Oh, and feel free to use the chat box for comments and other sorts of conversation. But questions should be put into the Q&A feature. Again, thank you everyone for coming out today. And especially thank you to our two hosts who have joined us today. With that, I think we can go ahead and start with introductions. If you'd like to share a little bit about who you are and your work with our audience, over to you. Hi there, this is Dr. Raja Kushal Nagar. And I don't know how the interpreter has already pronounced the name and I can't tell her how to pronounce it, but I do care about how it's spelled, so I do make sure that people get the ordering of the letters correctly. So I say that just to let you not be so intimidated by my name. As was said, I, was, I am a professor at Gallaudet University where I focus on accessible technology and information communication, especially has, as it has to do with communication, sign language, and other possibilities including multi-sensory types of communication. So uh, again, my research is rather broad. And now I will let Josefa introduce himself. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, first of all, thank you for um, you know, involving me in this event. I'm very excited to be um, a panelist alongside Raja. My name is Josefa Rangwala, I'm a faculty in computer science at George Mason University, one of the other Georges uh, in, this, in this area. And uh, my research is in mostly applied machine learning and applied data mining. And along with Raja and other colleagues, I see one of them in the, in the, in the attendee list, uh, Professor Yana Kosecha and Parth Patak. We all are working towards uh, developing a 
uh, a, a sign language recognizer um, for essentially Alexa. And we'll talk more about this, uh, but but I but I'm super excited to be at this event. And um, I think a great event is when the when the audience participates. So please, you know, uh, ask your burning questions and hope you've seen that great video that Raja uh, had prepared before because that really opened my eyes. So um, should we get started on the on the Q and A? So so again, Raja, good, great to see you again uh, after you know this uh, this two years of lockdown, almost like or feels like ten years, uh, and you haven't aged even a bit. So that's really exciting. Um, so how far are we away from a sign recognizing Alexa, uh, which performs as well as a voice recognizing Alexa? Hmm. Well, so that's a good one to get started with. I know that sign language recognition, in general, there's multi, there's several tiers of complexity. First is computer vision, then there's linguistics, there's the meaning-based understanding and translation, interpretation. So to get a an equally functional system that recognizes sign language, I think will take several years. Even right now, generally speaking, recognition and understanding tools have taken several years to get to where they are today. But if we at least just focus on the recognition of words, meaning identification of signs, that's a much simpler problem to, um, to solve. It still involves language and linguistic understanding, vocabulary. So, I think depending on your def, you know, it depends on the definition of the problem space. If you confine it to more simple things like home-based use, I'd say that we're just a few years away. But anything beyond that, I think we're looking at at least 10 to 20 years um, at a minimum, because we're at a minimum 10 years behind speech recognition efforts. And I've been very happy to collaborate with you, Josefa, on sign recognition with a different with different kinds of technology, so not only computer vision, but with radio and Wi Fi, as there are multiple ways to approach the problem. Thank you. Um, and Raj, I'm curious, um, in the research that you do with your students, uh, have you made any, um, you know, have you made any potential progress that will help you solve some of these barriers or, or what do you see are the biggest barriers today, right? So what is the what is the one biggest challenge that we all should be working on? Hmm. Well, in general with machine learning, we have to work with big companies and I've tried looking at timing They've spent millions of dollars focusing on speech recognition, machine learning, and we don't have those sorts of resources for sign languages yet. So we'll have to wait for that technology to sort of trickle down and become available for sign languages or find a corporation that's willing to invest the, the time and money on the back end for the machine learning part of that training. But on the front end, it, I think there's a lot more potential um, and again, limited arenas with apps like Google Maps, home-based usage, um, more commonplace sorts of things under the umbrella of command and control. But I think that, you know, more things could be made possible more quickly, but in areas, if you want to include like finger spelling, um, anything where you're using an incomplete version of sign language, I think it still would have to be, we'd have to be clear on what that means, that it wouldn't really be language per se. It would include some components of language, not the entire linguistic system. So I think if we focus on limiting the problem to things like finger spelling, which I'm happy to say, I think we're pretty close to that being possible within maybe just a handful of years, two, three. And also gesture recognition is another component. People are working on that on campus at Gallaudet as well. So they are working on gestural um, recognition systems. And of course, gesture recognition is different than sign recognition um, because 
there's not the linguistic components that you need to worry about. And it's a much more limited um, type of detection, but it can still be very helpful, especially for home use. Great, great. So I'm, I'm also curious, um, I, I think there's a question in the chat that I think I could take, which is related to our discussion. Uh, Jason asks, um, you know, how the data is structured. Do the fingers and face play any role in sign language recognition for Alexa? What is the quality and granularity of the data itself? And he's also curious about the type of modalities. Uh, is it camera, depth sensors, LIDAR? What, are, what is being used? So for machine learning, you need to take a couple of approaches. One is to think about training it to coordinate the speed, to um, segment its input. We've borrowed technology from speech recognition for segmentation and in order to apply that to finger spelling segmentation. I've worked with the, a team at Google or excuse me, I'm currently working with a team at Google to both segment and detect individual letters and numbers. Would you say something about the capture methods um, that you have seen being used like camera, depth sensors, LIDAR? Well, training requires depth sensors, but when you actually run the application, then you don't need it. You can just run it with regular 2D video. That's great. Um, what, one uh, interesting thing that I think, Raja, you mentioned is that um, you know companies have invested a lot in speech recognition technologies, right? And I think we see, um, we see the usage of it right now on Zoom, right? You could translate my speech into Spanish, for example, very easily. And I think it's exciting to envision um, our speech being translated uh, A, in sign language automatically and vice versa, both ways, but also thinking about American sign language to British sign language. And have you, have you thought about that? What are your thoughts on that? That is something that I've thought about. Um, that would mean machine learning for each language, just like there is speech recognition for each language. So this is a multiply, a multi-layered challenge. First, there's the algorithms, the technology, and the data. And the more you have of each, then it becomes an easier problem to solve per language. Okay. Um, Athena is asking you, um, as a deaf and a signing educator in the computer science field at a deaf university, uh, what are some barriers that you have observed in deaf learners trying to engage with and learn computing in general, programming, machine learning, and even this technology that we have talked we are, we are talking about? So. I'd say that the main barriers really um, first I think of as the lack of vocabulary in the field. Um, I think, of course, most of the curriculums are in English and the videos are of people speaking and describing things at the same time. And because looking is listening for us, it's hard to follow just by watching the captioning because you end up missing out on some of the nuances or the context of these explanations. So I think that's, that's the first thing I think of. Um, and then vocabulary in the sense that we don't have certain standardized signs yet to refer to these concepts that have become established in English. And there are multiple, often it will require multiple signs to refer to the same concept to explain how something works. So I think it amounts to having full linguistic, not having full linguistic access in English and ASL. So it's not enough to just have 
what's available in English be translated into text. So that's one component. Another is to have the vocabulary in ASL for these same concepts. Could you speak a little bit more about um, at Gallaudet, you know, what are, how many students are being served and what are the typical graduation rates for Gallaudet University for an undergraduate program in STEM, for example? So we have about 40 students in an IT, in our IT major, which is a pretty good number. And it's been increasing, I think, as there's more interest in applied technology, both traditional information technology and also in new fields like this, accessible technology, sign language recognition, and generation. Another, there's another major in a related field, data science. And that also is an area where you can apply skills related to machine learning to the whole set of sign language research. There's another field, uh, excuse me, another major, other majors that we have in the STEM field. So biology, chemistry, public health, each of them offer their own perspectives, but usually it's more about those who are in IT and data science. Great. Um, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask you a question about, you know, when I talked to you a long time ago, um, you gave me the uh, idea of, you know, you told me captioning, right? Captioning translated into being used at airports and other places. Um, do you envision um, how these sign language technologies uh, would move beyond the deaf and hard, deaf and hard of hearing community, right? Could it move beyond, could it scale to beyond there? And what do you think as a application for that? Well, first I'll actually go back a moment. I forgot to mention another major that we have at Gallaudet that is related, um, which is communication, because that is also a field that provides a really rich experience with language, video, the use of video. So I just wanted to mention that major. Now, as for applied technologies um, and ways in which it might apply to the broader community or society, Definitely, I think this is not just relevant for speech, but also for gesture recognition, facial um, expression recognition, body language. I think a lot of people don't think about these benefits. And that's why I think a lot of things like Zoom conversations think that supplying video and audio is enough, but that's not it. That's not, that's not all that we rely on. We really rely on facial expressions, um, body language, gestures, so I think that this way you can get the full spectrum of recognition of how we use language from speech to signs, and that will help us make technology even better. That will be optimal for everyone, not just deaf people and not just for hearing people, but everyone in between, because everybody gestures. Everybody relies on facial expression. And I think that's a really key point to this kind of technology is that we are running, we're working on the entire gamut from communication that's fully auditory to fully visual. I mean, think about the way that you communicate with other drivers on the road if you want to change lanes or let somebody merge. We gesture to each other all the time. Self-driving cars don't understand those gestures. If <laughs> self-driving cars could understand other drivers' gestures, I think that could help a lot. That's a, that's a great, great point, Rajai. I, I really like that. Um, Yana Kosecha asks, what are the other application domains you would consider interesting and viable to tackle with some limited version of ASL recognition, like video games, uh, augmented reality, and tools for teaching ASL? Well, technically, uh, as a technologically focused person, it's hard for me to think about the full scale or range of applications. 
I depend on folks like you in the audience to come up with ideas for ways in which this technology could be used. So be it education or the arts, communication, you name it. That's, that's what makes it so great when we brainstorm as a community. Um, Josefa, do you have any ideas? Anyone in the audience, do you have other ideas for where you think that this technology could be used? I think games for sure. And then and I think Athena is asking a similar question where, you know, there are VR apps and games that have technology that allows for one-to-one -one representation hand tracking and recognition recognition of some specific in-app actions. Uh, so she she asked, why, why can't we use that right now? Why don't we use that right now to improve the experiences of with sign, sign recognition technology? The only API currently available could recognize finger spelling, and that's the only it's the only one that I know of that's available open source. But for bodily or skeletal recognition, those are available, but they just aren't at the level that would be needed to understand sign language. There's a lot of research happening on them, but they haven't become open source yet, unfortunately. Um, the one that I know of that. Yeah, focuses on gesture is an open source, but the one that focuses on finger spelling is. So I think that it might, oh, I've also have seen some teaching apps where they can um, basically give you feedback on your ability to, on signing when you're learning how to sign, but I haven't seen an API that um, has been incorporated into a game yet. Yeah, I mean, I, I think- uh, Ask me again in a couple of uh, months or years though, and maybe I'll have a better answer. Yeah, months, months. I'll, I'll certainly ask you. It's a fast moving field, right? So there is a lot of interesting uh, things happening right now. Um, uh, so stu a graduate student of mine um, and worked with Yana and us to look at hand, 3D models of hand and see if the 3D models of hand uh, would give you better input into finger, figuring out fine gesture recognition for essentially ASL. Um, and, and he tried to do that and he got some, I would say he got some success there. Um, so there is, I would say there is some bridging of applications in VR to, to sign language. So that's happening, Athena. That's what I would say. Let's see. There are some more questions here. Um, Julie asked, um, can this technology be applied to robotics uh, if there are more robots in the service industry, such as food, can we sign our order and the robot receives visual input from that? Um, and she's also concerned that increase of robots uh, could lead to other societal challenges. So robotics, I think this is sort of an interesting like reversal because then it would be sign generation instead of sign recognition. You could also use that for people who are deaf blind, who uh, rely on communication in a tactile form. So a robot could recognize signs and then produce it tactilely and that could potentially solve some of the issues, communication issues that deaf blind people face. This would be akin to having like a braille keyboard, but braille keyboards aren't really used by most deafblind people. This is my understanding anyway, that they primarily use tactile means of communication, whether it's tactile ASL or pro-tactile. So I think that's one application with robotics. Yeah, I also think, um, um, you know, in our, in our collaborative work, uh, we're using um, Wi-Fi as, as one of the modalities, right? And uh, one of the applications that we were thinking right now um, in, is that, you know, when folks are biking, right, they would like to know how does, they would like to sense their environment, right? See, you know, who's on the left, who's on the right, who's behind them, and they're going to make a, make a right turn, 
is a car also going to, or when they're going straight through a right turn, is a car making a right turn? So, so I think we also see some, you know, some of the similar uh, approaches to, for sensing uh, that we're using in our sign language technology to be used for uh, making um, safer biking, right? And I don't know if you have seen things like that um, in 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 the in the community at at Gallaudet or in the students that you see. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, there's lots of potential for sensing the environment, like um, if you're out and walking and signing or having a signed conversation. I think you could add Wi-Fi sensing to just have limited computer vision that would require a fixed camera point of view. I think that that's really hard though. So like, for example, if you're holding a mobile device and signing, that means that you only have one hand available to sign because your other hand is holding the mobile device. So if you could remove that need for the front facing camera and holding your, um, your iPhone, then you would have both hands available to you. And then it would be more like what it is when people give audio commands. So it might be that you wear something wearable on like a lanyard type device. And then that way, any view can be captured and then you're free to do whatever you want. And the experience becomes more equal to what it's like when you're speaking and listening. Um, and the same would be true for when you're signing and having the computer detect or the camera detect. Last, is there another consideration? Um, not just for communication, but also recordings themselves and for viewing other people. So let's say I'm on the phone, I've got my mobile device, I have the camera facing me to capture what I'm saying, but for me to see what they're saying, I still need to be holding my mobile device. So your so eyeglasses could be made available as screens to see what other people are saying, so to be communicated to. So that's something else to consider with sign language. It's not just about sign language recognition or detection, but perception. Yeah, I, I guess since we're talking about cameras and you're talking about these modalities, and as you just said, you know, my camera is seeing somebody. Are you concerned at all about the privacy of these systems then? And how do you protect the, maybe protect the user themselves or protect the people around them if they, um, they don't want to be recorded? Um, or so how do you deal with that? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so, right, there's an entire field dedicated to that very question in computer science now with machine learning called fairness, accountability, ethics, and transparency. And it is becoming more and more important, or at least the recognition of it is, because these sorts of problems that you just mentioned are being identified. So they focus on not only technological adjustments, but also just educating people about privacy issues. So for example, with speech, there's a long history of knowing what is public and what is private, but because visual communication is different than audio communication, um, there are two key things that really distinguish them. One is that with audio communication, it's volume based. So the amount of access you have to it depends on the proximity. And the further you go out, your intensity drops by two. So you could whisper when you're speaking and only allow maybe the person just a few feet away from you would be within earshot. But visual communication doesn't follow that same rule. The drop off is linear. So the farther away you are from someone, it doesn't fall off by a factor of two. It, you can still understand someone quite literally and it's linear. So you, you, there's no real way to whisper in the same way that you can whisper in English. So what you have to do is use a physical obstacle. So you could sign under a table so that the person nearest you could see what you're signing, but someone on the other side of the table 
wouldn't be able to see you. So there's different ways to whisper, but it just doesn't happen in the same way that auditory whispering does. Now, when you communicate, what's captured around you, let's say that you're outside of what's considered earshot or if there's a visual analog to earshot, um, then that would define what our expectations of privacy are. So for example, if someone's pretty far away, they can rest assured that they wouldn't be captured. And then another consideration with captioning is to think about how to show distance in captions. So first you, we, you could try to modify the size of the fonts or the captioning, but that failed because those sorts of textual modifications don't really follow the same intelligibility um, experiences that you have when sound is low. So what they did was adjust transparency so that you could get a sense of how near or far a speaker was. So you have to think about what the principles are of visual communication and what principles actually give an equal or similar experience to what happens when you communicate auditorily and vice versa. Great, thank you. Um, I see Rachel is asking, to what extent do you think the study of depiction in sign language is important in creating linguistically accurate sign language AI services or applications? Essentially, she wants to know um, if I want to know what the weather is on my Alexa app, should I just blurt out weather or should I be polite and say, Alexa, please tell me the weather in Washington, DC? Sorry, just reading the question. Could you repeat it? So, so the question is, maybe I, I don't know if I can highlight that, um, but her question is um, essentially how important it is for sign language uh, to create, uh, to essentially generate recognition, to generate linguistically accurate sentences for these AI service applications, right? So, um, and Rachel, correct me if I'm on the wrong track, well, but my thought is I think if I was to ask Alexa, I could just say, what's the weather? Or I could just say weather, uh, or I could say, you know, I could be more accurate. I could be more formal. I could say, please tell me what the weather is today at this hour in Washington, DC. That's much long, much longer sentence for it to um, get correct. And, Okay. So I think that this question really gets to the idea of expectations and that we would probably have to rein in those expectations. So let's say that you have a signing avatar. There's something called the uncanny valley where if it's not realistic enough, people don't like it. It looks too eerie, but the same thing happens with communication and language quality. So if it's, there's a point at which it's not good at all. So um, there's a phrase expect less and, or what is it, Ex hope for the, hope for the best, expect the worst. So sort of if you, if you expect to be able to communicate in just two to three word phrases, and not have any formal communication, you can get away with pretty simple, um, a pretty simple string of vocabulary. But if you're expecting full communication, then that requires a great deal of fluency, linguistic expression, um, rhythm, any less, and people will be disappointed. So it's a really tough balance to strike and you get one or the other, but there's not a whole lot available in between so I think it's best to start with what's simplest, given the technical considerations and limitations. And then over time, as technology improves, then we can consider 
having the full spectrum of communication available. Okay. I might have missed the uh, explaining that question correctly, according to Julie out there. So maybe I think if you folks could paraphrase the question again, uh, we could re-ask that. So one of you, if you could do that for me, thank you. Uh, in the meantime, um, why have there been so few high-tech learning tools for deaf and hard of hearing students implemented in the classroom? It looks like there are many tools which work in the lab. Uh, what are the barriers that prevent them from making the leap outside of a lab and into the classroom? I think that's really hard to transition from research to practice. That sort of translation is difficult in general. Um, I think the same goes when you innovate new possibilities, but then other things end up becoming easier to use, easier to understand, easier to apply. It does take a lot of work and it often takes an entire team of people working together to make these sorts of technologies that we use easier to use. Research, though, isn't about the end user. So you could have an idea that you can do this research on. You could bring it to a developer and you know, have them make something that an end user might use something in a classroom, but it could end up being something really completely different to what you initially had in the lab. Okay. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, translating is hard, right? We uh, do uh, research and research transitioning to practice. Uh, is a is a challenging problem right so it means i innovate a lot on educational technologies and i hope that they come to the classroom some years from now but um i, I wouldn't be comfortable doing them right away unless they have been thoroughly tested for instance um so let's see i answered that julie asked you about visual sensitivity um Topic of visual sensitivity is one of the biggest issues that hasn't been solved. Um, don't know if Raja, you can take that or we need more context there. Yeah, Julie, could you provide a little more context to what you mean about visual sensitivity? And then as Julie is providing us context, you know, why, why don't we see, uh, why don't we take back that research to practice question and, uh, and see if there are certain tools. Uh, Athena wants to know what are the some tools that we can learn and use to create sign recognition technology in current generation apps and games. So she wants to create, or she if she wanted to create a game mod to insert a signing avatar and sign recognition into a popular game, where should she start? Hmm. Well, I think, again, here, this is about managing expectations of what's possible. So, for example, for teaching, you actually need to make sure that it's a pretty manageable um, amount of screen space, for example, because a person would need to copy you. That's one approach. You would also have to make sure that it's flexible enough to copy the, or to capture the sign. So again, there's just a range from information to communication. The more information-based it is, there are different requirements for the sensitivity levels to pick up on 
all things that are contributing to communication, facial expression, movements, et cetera. The more communication based it is, you're looking at sort of the, the gestalt of things like overall, you know, the facial expression, yes, um, context, those things are involved and then the complexities become magnified and then you need much more sensitivity and much more information to achieve that. So it's a much more challenging design. So I'd suggest you always start on the information end of the spectrum for whatever application you're looking for. And then later as the technology catches up, then you can have more communicative applications. Great, yeah, um, that's, that's um, excellent. Um, Raja, I wanted to, I was just wondering in this uh, pandemic, um, I was telling uh, earlier that, you know, I live close to Gallaudet, but uh, as an outsider, I wasn't allowed in there. Um, how were you teaching uh, during this pandemic? What was the mode? Well, wow. So teaching over Zoom has been really challenging. Um, fortunately, all of us as a Gallaudet community developed strategies to teach online effectively and to use a software that honestly was not designed with hearing, uh, with deaf people in mind. It was designed for hearing people to have just a visual component to their communication. The way that the technology is, is that it prioritizes audio over video. So for example, the video compression was awful. The resolution was terrible. Um, you know, the, for the range of, of all the range of video conferencing platforms, Zoom was best, but it was by no means perfect or ideal. So to give you an example that is still unresolved, it prioritizes the speaker. So you can have it automatically pin the speaker, but you can't have it automatically detect motion and then move a person into the speaker window based on motion. So the detection algorithms that they use prioritize auditory based communication. But again, um, this is an example of one of those distinctions between research and practice. The different look, one other thing about video communication is that the cameras are really poor substitute for our eyes. So you could, since you're not communicating in a shared space, if you point at something, it's not clear what you're pointing to. You don't know where a person is looking. If you're a viewer and you see someone looking and pointing somewhere, the looking doesn't help. So we've tried to simplify things and make do, but it by no means is an adequate substitute for face-to-face -face communication. So I'm very much looking forward to returning to in-person teaching this fall. That's great. Yeah, I, me too. I, 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 you know, I didn't have as many challenges as you did, but we had challenges uh, because I've never taught online or did not like it. Um, and I feed off, feed off people. Uh, I feed off other people's personality. Um, so I, you know, I, I did not, when only 10 students would put their video on out of hundred students, um, I would feel really sad, like, a, you know, a, a rock show going bad essentially. So, um, so I'm happy to get it, get back in person. Um, I, so I think Athena, we answered, Raja did answer your question on translating beyond deaf and hard of community. So I'm just gonna say we did that. And Julie has another question there. I don't know how much time we have left. We have about 10 minutes here, right? Um, moderators. Yes, okay, great. Uh, so Julie asks about um, if we increase this field. So is it possible to create virtual 3D closed captioning that is translated into ASL? Not sure I exactly know what that is. Maybe we could take that offline or try to answer that later. Well, okay, I just was, I think I maybe get what um, Julie's driving at here. I think that she's asking about um, basically print to sign 
automated print to sign, which is different than going from speech to sign. So if you already have words put into text order, um, you would be able to translate if you had ASL and gloss, which is a text version of, well, I guess let's put aside the concept of glossing mm -hmm. and think about it just as going from words to sign. Is that what you're asking about? Judy, could you help us? I, I guess as um, I think I'm going to ask, so there she says, I meant instead of words that are translated by auditory method, the auditory method would create visual, oh, I get it now, would create visual ASL with a fake person, like an avatar uh, for all encoding. Right. And so that would be signed in 3D space you're thinking of, Julie? Recording in progress. So if you're talking about producing something that would offer signing in 3D space. That is different because you would have to deal with 360 degrees of visibility. So there's two different concepts. One would be um, the language, whether it's spoken or signed, text or signed is always in front of you. So that means it would stay front facing wherever you turn your head, it's sort of um, yoked to the, to your face, if you will. Then the other approach is that the environment stays where it is, regardless of your head orientation. So it depends on the application for interpreting. I would say that it's better to be yoked to the viewer because audio is 360 degrees, but for natural sign language communication, it would be the opposite, that you could leave the input fixed in the environment and it would not be yoked to the viewer's head orientation. Got it, got it. Um, I have one, you know, I think we have five minutes. I want to sneak in a question that was born, that I came with, um, right? So one of the projects that we are embarking on, and this is essentially motivated by the pandemic, you know, we, I saw um, many of the, uh, on YouTube, there are now lots of, uh, recordings with a signer with somebody doing sign language right for whatever recording usually in the you know governor Cuomo is making some presentation in New York and there'll be a signer um, uh, embedded in the video and what we wanted to, and one of the challenges that we usually face face in training any of these sign language models is data where do we get data from uh, we could collect user data um, so a question that is burning uh, within us uh, within our group is how can we leverage YouTube data um, to bootstrap or to train our machine learning models? And have you seen things like that? <laughs> I think that this is an unsolvable problem because of privacy concerns. Good point, it's a good point, yeah. All right, thank you, thank you very much, Rajat. It was a, thank you all. Um, don't know what the protocol is, but I will see you. Too, by the way. It was good to see you again. Likewise. Okay, well, I thought I would come back on screen to thank both of you. This was a great discussion. Um, it was really enjoyable to sit and learn and listen to both of you. So 
again, thank you so much for accepting our invitation um, to be with us today. Um, this event is not the last event in the Crest Fest, by the way. We're about halfway through now. We've got a few more events lined up over the next two weeks. Next Tuesday, we have what we expect to be a very fun event. It'll be a panel on hot topics in sign language technologies. And we thought this would be a perfect place to log in if you're interested in ethics and these sorts of complicated topics and issues. So be sure to tune in next Tuesday if you're interested in that. And be sure to ask some of those burning questions there as well. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Kushalnagar and Rangwala. See you again soon. Take care. Bye.